Hello, and welcome to this free event, this great faculty event, walking through the Voice to Parliament handbook written by prominent Indigenous leader Thomas Mayo and acclaimed journalist Kerry O'Brien. I'm Christine Kaninmonth. A very warm hello to our regular members and to those of you who are joining our community for the very first time. Thanks so much on behalf of the growth faculty team for being here with us. We're broadcasting from the lands of the Gurringai uh, on Sydney's northern beaches in Australia. And we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay our respects to leaders past, present and emerging. On that note, we are standing by to put your questions to Thomas Mayo and also to Kerry O'Brien on the Voice to Parliament and our upcoming referendum. So um, I can see Thomas and Kerry standing by there um, in, their, in their Sydney hotel rooms. <laughs> uh, I do encourage everybody to ask questions today. Uh, there is no such thing as a stupid question. I'm hoping to ask plenty. Uh, and I can see questions are already coming through in the Q&A button down there at the bottom. So please put your questions in that Q&A and not in the chat so that I don't lose side of them. So Thomas Mayo and uh, Kerry O'Brien, uh, congratulations on, on, on a very readable handbook. As you can see here, everybody, it's a, it's a very uh, small volume really, um, but full of facts and, uh, and also some wonderful uh, cartoons from one of my favourite cartoonists, Kathy Wilcox. So uh, really, really terrific, um, really terrific handbook to read to, to, get the, to get the information. As they say, it's all the detail you need. Uh, but we, we're not going to ignore the no vote. We're going to certainly ask questions about, uh, about that as well. Thomas, let's come to you first. Uh, why did you and Kerry write this handbook? Yeah, thank you, Christine. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, where I'm coming from, uh, and they're always past and present. I wrote the book because I knew that people would be uh, looking for information to... Uh, initially, it was uh, my, my first idea was to be able to help to help people that were um, supporters or leaning towards yes, uh, to be able to go out there and advocate themselves. So to firm up their position in support with uh, you know a whole lot of facts and personal insights, and then to get out there and uh, and help us do the work to help other Australians understand. Um, the idea was uh, you know something small like a handbook, uh, people could put um, easily uh, carry around or put in their back pocket. Um, you know, something light and easy to post so they could send copies to, to friends and family. Um, and uh, when I, uh, I was starting to run out of time last year to get it started and um, I thought I needed a co-author and I could think of no one better than Kerry O'Brien um, with all of his experience. Um, I wanted uh, a non-Indigenous co-author because this is about all Australians. So, um, and that's, uh, that's how we got going, yeah. So let's go to that acclaimed journalist, uh, Kerry O'Brien. Kerry, uh, great to see you're involved here. Um, what uh, is the voice to Parliament? I guess let's just start off with the basics. Well, it's really, despite the attempts by some to make it sound like an extremely complex proposition, it's really quite simple. Um, uh, the, the, the first part of it uh, is to constitutionally acknowledge first Australians and their 65,000 plus years of continuous civilization, which is possibly the one thing uh, that really makes this nation stand out in a unique way compared to every other nation on the face of the earth, the oldest continuous civilization uh, on the planet. And the second part uh, is to guarantee permanence to a, an advisory voice of indigenous people elected from within Indigenous communities at the most grassroots levels around Australia to make representations uh, to government and the parliament on key policy areas uh, that will relate directly uh, to, and will have impact directly on Indigenous Australians uh, as that policy is being debated uh, and formalised within that government and parliamentary process. That is the kernel of it. It guarantees a permanence uh, to an advisory body, and it is advisory only. It isn't, as some people have claimed, a third chamber of parliament. That is a joke. It would not have, as those same people have claimed, the power of veto over any government policy or any, any uh, matter before parliament. It, it would have to rely purely on the quality of that advice and the integrity of that advice advice um, 
uh, as to how seriously that was taken by the parliament. So the, the one responsibility that falls on government and the parliament uh, is to actually read the advice and consider what it might add to enhance a draft policy during that process. Okay, so the referendum date hasn't been called yet. We're waiting any day for that date to be called. But in the meantime, Thomas, what problem are you hoping The Voice will solve? Yeah, so The Voice will solve uh, really uh, the, 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 um, the voicelessness of our people. So as for around 4% of the population spread across this great continent, you know, over 170 uh, electorates, um, many of our people uh, living in remote communities um, and, uh, and we take it for granted, a lot of us on um, access to, um, you know, all sorts of abilities to, to reach um, our members of parliament and decision makers. But in some remote communities, you know, it, it's, you don't have uh, reliable power, let alone reliable internet uh, or, or phone, um, you know, uh, reception. Um, so it's really difficult for us um, to be heard. So um, as, as that only 4% of the population spread across this continent and over 170 electorates, it's really hard for us to have um, to be heard, um, and what this does is it gives us uh, the resources, the opportunity to come together um, through representatives that we choose to ensure access to the parliament and the government to help shape policies and laws. And so, what is common across all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are issues around health and education, employment. Um, infrastructure in, in, in most remote communities, just clean running water and all these sorts of things. And so those are the things that uh, we would uh, have um, solutions for, that we can consistently take to the parliament, work with the executive to, to be able to get things right. And it is the key to closing the gap. So what happens at the moment if I'm in a remote community and, and I want something done about, about the situation that I find myself in? What happens at the moment where, where that being listened to by Parliament stops and, and, the, and you feel a referendum and the voice is needed? What is happening to those communities now where yeah. they feel something is, something is um, in needed, they need their voice? So at the moment, they would go to their local member of Parliament. Does that not solve the problem uh, at that level? No, because uh, let me give an example. I was at um, the Yule River Bush meeting recently, which is... Uh, an annual gathering of the, the people of the Pilbara, um, the Aboriginal tribes of the Pilbara. Uh, they come together at this place, Yule River, where they've been meeting for thousands of years. Uh, and so they have this meeting uh, annually. And um, what they uh, had done uh, when I first went there with the Uluru Statement Canvas back in 2017, was that they established a, a Pilbara advisory voice to be able to speak to um, for their interests to the state parliament. And this voice had some funding for a, a while, but that funding did not continue. And so that voice was, you know, basically uh, discontinued. And so at this meeting this year, uh, only uh, in June, uh, they were talking about re-establishing it. They were talking about their frustrations on the butcher's paper. They had all those issues, health, housing were the priorities, okay? Um, and the politicians flew in on the second day. And, and what people were saying is we, we have to wait for the politicians to come to us, right? And uh, the ability for us to have representation is, you know, uh, set up and then it, it, it's taken away. Um, and, and so this would give the ability for us to proactively take the solutions and continue to work on it with the parliament and with the government um, without waiting for them to come to us. And also by the Australian people passing this at a referendum, it sets up the expectation that that opportunity for Indigenous people should continue. Now, just to, to go a little bit further on that, to illustrate the difficulty to be heard otherwise is, is to consider that these communities are, you know, hundreds of kilometres away from Port Hedland, the nearest town. Um, they have uh, um, poor roads, you know, so, um, you know, it's, it's uh, they have few people with a driver's license, you know, you've got multiple families living in one house. Uh, there's uh, 
internet is unreliable, as I said, as well as power. Um, and all of those issues make it really hard to gather, you know, more regularly than, than that once a year and to come up with the solutions and with the, some strength, put them forward. And so this, this referendum is really important to say to future parliaments, all parliaments, that, that Indigenous people need the means to be able to come together, work on their solutions, bring it to us as, as, as they require. And, um, and also that would see transparency, uh, not just to Indigenous people about what our spokespeople take forward, but also all Australians. Okay, and that gives it some weight then. Uh, and, uh, and it will make a massive difference to all of those things that were the priorities uh, at Yule River and everywhere else that I see. So Kerry, um, we're asked to vote in a referendum for this. Can you explain uh, what a referendum is, what means when you change, what it means when you change the constitution and, and how the voice will work? Well, for a start, the, the constitution is actually a very small booklet. It's about the size of a passport. So there's not actually a great amount written in the constitution. You could say it's quite profound in the sense that it, it, it sets up the framework for our democracy and it borrows heavily on, on the British system of democracy for that, with the Westminster system of parliament, separation of powers between, uh, between the elected government, the parliament uh, and, uh, and the justice system uh, and various other aspects like that. And it was written 230 odd years, sorry, it was written, um, it was written um, 120 years ago. Mm. So, so even those people who were writing at the time would not have anticipated that 100 years later, everything that was written in that constitution was still completely relevant uh, to an immensely changing world. And even, even post-war, in my lifetime, uh, Australia has been subjected to extraordinary change. And some of those changes have required, if we're sensible about it, um, tinkering at least with the constitution. And, and that is what this does, that, that is what this proposition would do. Uh, it would recognise, as a formal statement, it would recognise the unique place of first Australians in our history and in our social fabric. Uh, so to, to make any change to the constitution, you have to have what is called a referendum. Uh, that referendum is, is enacted by an act of parliament, which has happened. The government, the opposition, the various independents, the Greens and so on have all debated the process and, and a final set of words that's going to be put to the people later this year was, was voted on and approved by the parliament. So then uh, it's up to us, the people, uh, to vote yes or no on that simple proposition. Uh, and it will require a national majority for the yes vote to get up. And it will require a majority of yes votes in four of the six states. So, so it's a kind of, it's a double hurdle uh, to get through. And so, so it's a, a pretty, it's a pretty rigorous test, really. And uh, and what history has shown is that where you don't have bipartisanship, uh, it's it's incredibly hard to get a referendum up. And in fact, only eight referendums out of forty four uh, have gone through uh, as a yes. So what oppositions know uh, is that uh, if they don't want if, if for whatever reason they want a referendum to fail, they, in their minds, it's a giant step towards achieving that simply by standing up and saying they oppose it. It's, it's almost, it almost doesn't matter the quality of the, of the arguments. The mere act of an opposition, uh, the parliamentary opposition opposing a referendum, uh, uh, a, a, a referendum um, question, uh, they they take a giant step down the road to defeating it. And that has been the case for 32. Uh, I'm getting my maths wrong here. Uh, for uh, for 30, 36 out of out of 44 referendum questions. Uh, I think Thomas and Thomas and I and uh, and and those people who have lined up behind this see this as a different set of circumstances because uh, we are a very different society. To the, we, 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 we are evolving ourselves as a society all the time. The last election, the last federal election, shows 
very distinct shifting patterns in the way people are thinking about their votes now, where perhaps in the past they didn't. I think there is every reason still to expect this to get up when people actually come to have an understanding of how simple it is and what the ramifications are and what a great gift it is to the nation uh, for it to happen. Uh, but, uh, but of course, it's not helped when so much of the campaign that's being run against it is based on either falsehood or misinformation. And and to the uh, the second part of the question, I'll go to Thomas for you to answer that around how will the voice work? How will it actually work? Yeah, so the what we're voting on is not how the voice will work. What we're voting on is that very simple proposition. It's a it's a principle um, that we should recognise Indigenous people by giving them a say, an advisory voice. That's that's what we're voting on. Um, the model, so how many people will be elected to the voice, um, you know, where the regions are, where the borders are, um, those types of things are decided by our parliament. Um, and, uh, you know, the parliament will follow the normal process of democracy. So I'll just summarise um, really quickly here. Um, the question that we are being asked here is if we should recognise Indigenous people by giving them a voice to make representations on matters that relate to us. OK, an advisory voice. When we answer yes to that, then the parliament uh, or the government uh, consults with Indigenous people around the country about what the model will be. Uh, then they take that to the parliamentary process. Um, the broader Australian public gets to comment on it. Uh, and then the parliament has its debate. Um, you know, the opposition, the crossbenchers, you know, all the rest, uh, independents, they'll join that debate. Uh, and then they will decide what the model is. That model will be flexible. And that's the reason it, it needs to be flexible because uh, these things need to evolve over time. Uh, and so um, what we're enshrining again is that principle uh, and how it works will be able to uh, improve over time. Um, it's a very simple concept. It's how our constitution and, and government system works. And Chris, yeah. Christine, just tacked on to that, yeah. Um, the, 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 the real reason why it is important to give permanency to the concept and principle of a voice to parliament is because if you look at the history, as we have done in the book, if you look at the history of previous attempts mm. uh, to, to actually have an Indigenous voice to parliament, and, and I keep stressing, an advisory voice to parliament, not a voice that dictates anything, but an advisory voice, is that, uh, is that every previous attempt has never lasted. Uh, you, the Whitlam government was the, was the first government to establish a real Indigenous voice to Parliament after the 1967 referendum gave the federal government power to have an involvement in Indigenous uh, affairs. Uh, the Whitlam government's model uh, was a pretty simple one. It was 41 delegates uh, elected from within Indigenous communities around Australia to represent them with an advisory voice. But when the Whitlam government went and the Fraser government came in, Malcolm Fraser changed that voice. He reduced the numbers, he narrowed the voting um, uh, conditions. And then when he went and, and the Hawke government came in, they got rid of the, the Fraser model and ultimately, it took them a while, but ultimately they introduced ATSIC which was actually quite a, a substantial body, uh, which actually achieved a lot of very positive things. Uh, it had some governance issues and it had its critics. John Howard saw it as a, what, as he called it, a black parliament. He'd voted against it in opposition. So the, 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 the Hawke and Keating governments go, the Howard government comes in, he acts as ATSI. He doesn't replace it with another voice at all. He, he disperses Indigenous responsibilities through the departments. So Indigenous people don't have a direct voice on policy. And then there's been this checkerboard ever since. Every time a government comes in, you get another change. So there's been no chance for a voice to parliament to actually grow and evolve, as Thomas has said, and to, to mature, uh, to, to be changed here and there, uh, to improve it. Uh, as it goes. And this is the story of it, practically every other institution that has become important in this nation. It takes time for something to develop and become truly effective. And the business about, about, um, about 
well, why, why isn't the detail written into the Constitution? As I said, the Constitution is a document about the size of a passport. And, uh, and as one, for instance, of how it works and how it doesn't work, in, in the original Constitution, the High Court was established as a part of the fabric of government. But it, the, the, the Constitution didn't say how the High Court should be constituted. It didn't say how many judges there should be. That was decided by the Parliament and took them two years of debate to determine uh, what, what the High Court would be. And in fact, on the first High Court, the first Prime Minister of Australia was put on it. So th that basically, um, it, it um, ignored the principles of separation of powers. That was changed. It wasn't changed through the Constitution, it was changed through the Parliament. So th those are the two, you know, the Constitution sets up the dot point principles that, that enshrine our, that, that enclose our or enfold our, our system of democracy. It is up to government and parliament to fill in the gaps and provide the detail. Yeah, it's one of those things where we were actually saying um, earlier about how everybody should have a copy of the constitution because when you see that little, that, that little uh, tiny document, you know, and in, in taxes, with taxes, it says the government has the right to, to um, collect taxes. And, and then, of course, parliaments subsequently have decided, you know, what that might be, uh, as, for example, the GST. And believe we me, have... it's a very long piece of legislation <laughs> now, <laughs> Christine, with volumes many, many volumes. over the decades. And I think people would be surprised when they see the Constitution, because I think people do expect it to be volumes and volumes of detail, in which it's not. We have a lot of questions coming through, and um, that's marvellous. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so let's get to a few of those. And please do vote up the ones that you would like me to ask, because... Uh, when we do get so many questions, you know, for me to be scrolling through, it's much more helpful um, if you scroll through and, and choose the ones you want me to ask. So, um, so uh, let's go to you, Thomas. 4% of Australians are Aboriginal. 4% of federal politicians identify as Aboriginal. How can it be said Aboriginal people are not represented in government? Yeah, it's, it is a good question. Um, the um, Indigenous members of parliament represent their electorates. Uh, not Indigenous people. Um, they also represent their political parties and, uh, and so therefore they're loyal to what their party uh, policy is. Um, An Indigenous voice is very different. It will focus on, indigenous, on improving policies um, around health, education and employment and, and those types of things. Um, also, uh, we don't know how many uh, Indigenous people will be elected to Parliament the next time around. So, uh, an Indigenous voice, again, is about consistency um, to see uh, that, um, uh, you know, we're able to speak to uh, matters relating to us going forward, regardless of how many are elected. Uh, Mark's question is getting a lot of uh, votes up. Um, Kerry, we'll go to you. Um, there has been a lot reported in print media about the payment of compensation as yet of an unknown amount. Will this be true? There's no relationship to the voice. I mean, the, 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 the bottom line is that, that we can expect an advisory voice to Parliament, which would be handpicked from within Indigenous communities to represent them and to be their voice and to reflect their knowledge, uh, their understanding, their cultural understanding, their, their understanding of what, what is needed in their communities and what will work in their communities. And hopefully they might ultimately be a part of the process of delivering uh, a more relevant policy, which leads to closing the gap. But, um, but you can absolutely expect that, that this body will be focused on improving conditions in various communities. But even if there was a matter of compensation, even if, even if, a, even if, even if in, in one instance, an Indigenous, uh, uh, the, the, the voice suggested compensation for something, and I can't see the circumstance in they would, I think. But, but even if it did, it's up to the government and the parliament to determine whether they believe that's relevant or not. So regardless of what advice this body gives, regardless of what advice the body gives, it will only be worth its capacity to persuade government and the parliament, not just the government, not just the parliament, but a combination of government and the parliament that that advice is sound. The business of compensation, if it comes up at all, would come up through treaty. 
And that's a process that's going to take a very, very long time. And, and, uh, and a treaty can only happen if all parties to the discussions on a treaty actually sign a document that they've agreed on. So, so much of this is, is utterly theoretical. But of course, if you want this to fail, you're going to go trawling through the whole landscape of possibilities. You're going to bring up the things that you think might most cause fear in people or indecision or confusion in people and hope that some of it sticks. That's how referendums traditionally get defeated. And if you, if you at the, at be, before this actual campaign had begun, if you had wanted to know how it was going to be run on the no side, all you had to do was go back and look at the way the referendum on the Republic was run uh, 20 odd years ago. Exactly right. the same template, create division, create confusion, sow the seeds with misinformation. And, and what's the, what was the slogan of, of the Republic referendum? If you don't know, vote no. You know, yeah, well, yeah. we want okay. to be, this is the Thomas, you were, you were going to jump yeah. in there. Oh, uh, just, uh, we're hearing that again. And it's just a quick reminder. Uh, to people that have been around for a while, we've heard, we've heard all these um, tactics of fear mongering before. Uh, when Indigenous people got equal wages in the in the sixties, they said that you know cattle stations would shut down, businesses would close if they had to pay Indigenous people equal wages. Um, when we uh, you know when Mabo was successful in a native title case and then through WIC, they were saying that people would lose their backyards and and lose their farms. Uh, you know, none of these things happened. Uh, you know, as Kerry mentioned, Howard said in the 80s that, um, you know, ATSIC would be a, a black parliament and it would veto the decisions of, of, of um, parliament. It didn't happen. I um, it's the same with this, as Kerry stressed, it's an advisory voice. The parliament still uh, is supreme and decides all things um, about laws and funding. Um, but the, the strength of the advice is what's important here. Um, the Australian people seeing what that advice is and the fact that the advice comes from the people that need, um, you know, better uh, policies um, and programs the most, um, that, is, that is what gives it its strength. Nevertheless, as, as Kerry was saying, referendums very, very hard to get up. Um, as he was saying, majority of states have to uh, vote yes, majority of Australians have to vote yes for it to succeed. Mandy has asked the question, if the no vote succeeds, what does that mean for Indigenous people and Australia's standing globally? Thomas, I'll come to you for that. It's something that I think about every day. Um, you know, I really believe that we can win. Uh, I'm confident of that. I'm confident, you know, I have great faith in the Australian people and their sense of fairness and that they won't be, um, you know, have the wall pulled over their eyes by this scare campaign. Um, but if we lose, it will, uh, it'll be have, it'll have massive detrimental impact on Indigenous peoples. You know, if you could just imagine being told, uh, you know, from this gener generous invitation, uh, a modest proposal just to listen to us and recognise that we've been here uh, all along uh, and for 60,000 years before Federation uh, of this nation, um, that uh, will be uh, a really sad moment uh, in our history. Um, and it will officially be saying, we don't recognise you. It will officially be saying, uh, you don't deserve a say when we make decisions about you. Um, you know, so, so really bad. And the, the world is looking on, um, they're watching. And, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we um, say to the world that we're the nation of the fair go. And, and as I said, I believe that. Um, but how will we uh, stand up, you know, with our head held high to speak to other nations about their human rights issues if we can't even recognise uh, Indigenous peoples in our constitution, which every other like nation has done. So we're behind. It's about us catching up. Jonathan has asked, and this is a good follow-up question to that, Thomas. Uh, he says, as a non-Indigenous person who is desperate to understand this matter fully, why are there so many Indigenous people, including community leaders and politicians who are against the voice? Yeah, an, another great question. Um, the answer is this, uh, it is a small amount compared to the amount of Indigenous people that are saying yes. Uh, I just want to make that clear first. But we're not homogenous. Uh, of course, we're going to have different opinions 
that come from our different experiences and uh, perspectives. Uh, and so that's normal. Um, at Uluru itself, when the big Uluru convention was held, there were 270 representatives from the 13 uh, three-day regional dialogues that were held in the months leading up to uh, that moment in, in, on the 26th of May, 2017. Um, about 20 Indigenous people walked out on the second of three days at Uluru. Um, they had a different set of opinions. You know, Senator Thorpe was one of them. Uh, and uh, they couldn't convince the great majority of us of what they were saying. Uh, on the third and final morning, uh, we, you know, we continued the hard work of, of trying to reach a consensus because it is hard work to reach a consensus. You do need to listen to each other and respect each other's opinions and practice reciprocity, uh, all of those things. And, um, and uh, on the 26th of May, that morning, the final morning, we endorsed the Uluru Statement uh, from the heart with standing acclamation and tears of joy and hope. So uh, an overwhelming consensus um, to call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the constitution. And so I hope that that will give you confidence, you know, that this process, I think if it was run again with, you know, um, more resources and more Indigenous people involved, it would find the same result because, you know, as Kerry talked about and as the book shows, there's a history of um, that informs this call um, and its good sense. Um, but also to add to your confidence is that um, there's been multiple polls done. Uh, the last one was uh, several months ago now, uh, and it was a sample of around 800 of 800,000 people, which is a considerable sample. It's not actually a small sample uh, for that uh, population compared to other political polls. And all of those polls are indicating over 80% support. And uh, I'm confident that it would be up to 90 or more percent of Indigenous people are voting yes to this now because we've just done so much work in communities to inform them, uh, you know, since we've had some resources to get out there and do that more recently. So be um, confident. Most yeah, so never, the, nevertheless, the point being made about um, these community leaders and politicians, so someone like a Warren Mundine, uh, mm. you know, Senator Little, um, others, th these people are prominent and, and making making their views known is yeah they're entitled to their views. confusing they, they are entitled to their views um but I, I just encourage people to also think about uh you know what where they might be coming from to have that position uh you know senator thorpe and uh senator price are both politicians um that represent you know uh price certainly you know the front bench of the coalition is bound to that position but there's also many liberals that support this you know um, Bridget Archer, Julian Lisa, uh, former nationals, Andrew G, you know, there's liberals for yes. So this isn't, um, you know, they've taken a position for their own reasons. There was a text message that was leaked recently that said it was all about the coalition getting to the, the starting line at the next election. So they have their reasons. Just think about those, you know, who backs them. Uh, you can compare that to the process that led to the making of the Uluru Statement. Uh, the most uh, a uniquely well-resourced and uh, well-formulated process uh, and the polling. Um, what most Indigenous people think is that we should vote yes. Okay, uh, so someone anonymous but, um, but voted up a lot uh, has asked, I want Indigenous Australians to be identified in the Australian Constitution as the first people in Australia but I'm uncertain about the voice. The referendum question only allows me to vote for both or none. I feel I'm being corralled into voting for the voice. I do not, as I do not trust politicians, I feel I have been forced to vote for something. It is likely, that is likely good for politicians, but may not be good for me. So my reaction is to vote no. Kerry, yeah. you're smiling. I want to get to you on that one, just to see what that <laughs> yeah. smile's about. Yeah, well, you can't I'm, stop smiling. I, I could end. How long have we got? How long have we? I mean, look, the, for a start, politicians are elected by the rest of us. We give them a job to formulate policy, debate it, shape it through the parliament, and run the country. That's their job. We give it to them. And if they let us down, we vote them out. But that's the politicians. I mean, uh, to, to, if you strip this back to constitutional recognition of Indigenous people, it is abundantly clear that the majority of Indigenous people would see that probably as not much better than beads and trinkets and mirrors. Hmm. You know, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, you might try to argue that it has great symbolic effect, 
it certainly can have a power, particularly if alongside it is something which takes a step further and gives some substance to the symbol. But what is the substance? We come back to it again. There is no risk. There is no threat. What is it that's going to go terribly wrong? You know, what is it out of this that threatens people? Nothing. Against that is the very real prospect that the policies that emerge from the parliament, from our institutions of government, will be more effective on the ground in Indigenous communities because they are listening to the advice of Indigenous people who know their conditions, who know their culture, who know their traditions, who know how things work and how things will, what things will work and what things won't. And that we will see, there is a very real chance that we will see the gaps of inequality that are so embarrassing to us all close. At the moment, as I understand it, there are four out of 19 um, uh, uh, issues on which gaps exist, gaps of inequity exist between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians where the gaps have closed as a result of policy. So that leaves 15 areas where policies have and are failing. What have we got to lose by this? It doesn't set up two Australias. You know, it doesn't create special privileges for Indigenous people. On the contrary, it is trying to create a more equal playing ground for us all so we can actually feel we are genuinely one united nation that reflects our original culture, our original custodians with their continuous civilization, their long continuous civilization, the the rule book that we embraced through our constitution, which we borrowed substantially from Britain, which is the foundation of our democracy, and the, the, the multinational nation that we now are as a result of those many nations uh, of immigrants who have come here, particularly since the post-war years, to create a rich combination of things which we now have an opportunity to turn into one whole narrative. Noel Pearson has talked about this eloquently. He's absolutely nailed it. That's what this comes down to. It is an immense opportunity for us to genuinely present ourselves, see ourselves and present our face to the world as a united nation, as a, as a, with a unity of purpose. Could I just add, please, Christine, um, this is the form of recognition that Indigenous people have asked for. And I think that's very important that th those to be recognised have said that we want to be recognised with more than just symbolism, but if you recognise us, we want you to hear us, you know, and, and for all the reasons we've already talked about, that's more than symbolic. It's about greater fairness and it'll get better outcomes and it, it'll save money as well. You know, it'll save taxpayer dollars because we'll get better outcomes for every cent that is spent, but we'll also save lives, you know, because we're talking about real lives here when we're talking about those gaps that Kerry mentioned. Nevertheless, I guess you've got to get 97% of the population over the line to have this work. And picking up on, on that last little 51%, um, pace. 51%. Sorry, 50, 51%. Sorry, yes. I guess 97% of the population have to have to vote. Uh, well, 100% of the population have to vote. Anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> but you need to get the 97% who are not Indigenous to majority, to majority vote. And I'm picking up on that little piece um, that was in that last uh, question around it might not be good for me, so my tendency is to vote no. How do you how do you get across this idea that, and I know you're very passionate, Kerry, about you know it's not going to hurt anybody, but this the no campaign very much um, talking about the idea that it's risky. Uh, there are some talk about you know there is no boundaries to what this covers. There's sort of no no offences around it, and they've even said in the a huge no fence. campaign. Yeah. Christine, there's a huge fence around it, and that fence is that that it it does it does nothing to subvert the the power and authority of the parliament. The 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 the, the decision making process begins; it ends with the parliament. Indigenous. Australians who are going to make up the voice once the decision is taken as to how many of them there will be, and, and at the moment the, 
the the only numbers that have been put on the table through the the previous process uh, under the previous government was a suggestion of 24. But whether it's 24 or 34 or 40, uh, the bottom line is the only power they will have will be the quality of their advice and whatever moral and political authority they can bring to the parliament because they will have been created through an expression of support by the nation. That's the sum total of what they have. All power in the end will reside with the parliament and the government. You can't, no one can get away from that. I mean, there, there are so, you, you, if you actually look at the pattern of the criticisms that are coming, practically all of them are designed to incite fear and indecision and division. I mean, where are their positive arguments? Where are their alternatives? Because if there is one thing that is irrefutable, it is that what is existing now has failed. So if we're just saying more of the same, then our arguments are bankrupt. So where are the positive alternatives? The truth is the other side in this debate are not presenting them. They are interested in the negative because they know on the basis of past referendums that more likely than not in their view, the negatives will work. Now, are we really going to decide the future of the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians uh, on the basis of a grab bag of negatives? We do have a lot of questions. I'm going to go through them quickly and see if we can get through a few. I've only got a few minutes left. Uh, so Gareth has asked, isn't the NIAA responsible for proactively communicating the needs of Indigenous Australians with the federal government? Will it still exist if the voice goes ahead or will it be a duplication of expenses? Thomas, just a couple of sentences on that and yep. then we'll go to the next question. Yep. The NIAA is a government agency. It's not a representative body. Uh, will it still exist? I don't know that. Um, though, uh, yeah, so it's simple as that. It's a government agency. It's not a representative body. Uh, its work would be better, uh, more effective if it was guided by, uh, um, you know, people from communities through this voice. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so next one to you, Kerry. My concern is that this would add a racial element to a constitution that explicitly does not refer or mention race refer to or mention race, no one group of citizens should be given any, any special treatment in the constitution based on race, contrary to the entire concept of democracy. Can you answer that one in a couple of sentences? Well, for a start, we are one race. We are the human race, wherever we are on the planet, we are the human race. We might talk about different ethnic groups. We might talk about different, different demographic groups, but we are one race. But we can talk about prejudice. And no, no recognisable group of people in this country has been more exposed to prejudice than Indigenous Australians who had this country for 65,000 plus years and essentially had it taken from them. You know, let's not kid ourselves. It was taken from them. And the history of that is now enshrined. And, and despite attempts through what were called the culture wars 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, to, to disguise the truth of our colonial and post-colonial history, the stolen generations, the massacres, the, the debilitation, the grinding down of people, the dispossession and so on. All of those things we are trying to address by this. And in one sense, it's simple. In another sense, it's potentially profound. So we recognise we recognize the culture. We recognise the unique civilization. And we recognise the dispossession and we say, we're not, we're not seeking to provide some privilege to this particular group of Australians. We are seeking to lift them up to the same level that other Australians have the potential. I mean, it's about, it's about allowing future generations of Indigenous Australians to have the same capacity to realise their potential as the rest of us. This is a nation of privilege, but the least privileged amongst us are Indigenous Australians. You know, how on earth can we somehow end up arguing out of this proposition? Letting people give advice to you is somehow giving them a special place of privilege in our society. I'm sorry, no. Thank you, Kerry. We can certainly uh, hear your passion. Um, 
so Jeff has asked, uh, up to date, the no camp has been more effective. The no camp has been more effective in spreading their messages, many of which appear to be clearly misleading and incorrect. The yes camp seems to be talking mainly to those who already like to vote, are likely to vote yes. Do you agree, Thomas? And what is the plan to reverse this? I know you said before we came on that you will not stop until the referendum date. Yeah, so, you know, fear and confusion is much easier. Uh, so that makes it more difficult for us. And Kerry has described that that is the normal strategy in a, a referendum no campaign. Um, for us, what we need is for all of you to support us, to, um, and it's not just preaching to the converted, we need the converted, those that are supporters, to get out there and help us to do the work. Um, I would love it for everybody on here that um, is a supporter to systematically work through uh, a list of everybody that you can possibly influence, have a respectful discussion with them, help them to understand that all we're voting on here is recognition and an advisory voice for Indigenous people that will improve uh, the lives of, of our people that are, are so um, marginalised at the moment. It's that simple. Have those conversations now, revisit it soon. Um, don't call people racist if they don't agree to it. Um, you know, acknowledge the differences of opinions and just give them something to think about. Uh, Yes23.com.au is the uh, website for the campaign. We're door knocking. We've got over 20,000 volunteers, uh, train stations. Please join as a volunteer through that website. Um, you know, we, we need to have those conversations with the people directly. Um, around 40% of Australians, we're told, haven't even thought about this, haven't even heard about it uh, or are undecided. Um, you know, that's an opportunity for us to get out there and, and, and speak with them. Uh, also, visibility. Um, help us by wearing shirts, getting the badges. Yes, 23 shop um, has the, all of that. So please get on there. Uh, and that is how we reach um, the Australian people. And I know they're fair minded. Once they have the truth, once they hear from you and you say, I'm voting yes, I'd like you to because it's safe and it's meaningful. You'll be surprised how many come over with you. Kerry, final words from you for the people watching today, plenty of them business people and entrepreneurs, plus a very wide range. We've got a lot of people on. Look, I, I just think that, that the, the, the arguments that we've talked about today and, and the logic that sits behind this proposition, this referendum, uh, it, that it's not that difficult to understand if you're prepared to make the effort. We have heard anecdotally many, many, many times since the book first uh, hit the bookshops. Uh, there are now something like 70,000 copies in circulation. Um, and, and we just keep hearing again and again, people who who pass the book on after they've read it to say an uncle or a, or a parent or a grandparent uh, who had been expressing no or expressing reservations. And those people read the book and they come back and they say, now I understand, I've changed my view. Now, that's just one small illustration of, of the power of the word. If people are prepared to take a responsibility to just, uh, for instance, within your own family circle, uh, within your workplace, amongst your wider circle of friends, uh, educate yourself so you've got a clear understanding. And then when people say, why are you voting yes, you can tell them. And I think you'll be surprised at how many people's view opens up once they get the facts. So uh, I, I, I think for anyone who is now convinced about, about the, the virtue of voting yes, for heaven's sake, spread the word because you're going to feel a whole lot better uh, on referendum day. Um, thank you so much. And look at this, a, a lot of positive comments coming through on the chat. Um, everyone saying many thanks. Um, well, they can feel your passion. They really thought that was an, an excellent uh, presentation. So thank you so much. Uh, I've been talking to Thomas Mayo and Kerry O'Brien, who are also authors of the Voice to Parliament Handbook, all the detail you need. Uh, wonderful book, not very big, very light to send, as they were saying, and I think it retails for under $20. So uh, a big thank you to Thomas Mayo. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Best of luck with their, all your Thanks. campaigning. And uh, Kerry O'Brien, to you, thank you very much. Good luck with the book and uh, appreciate you coming on today. Thank, thank you. I'm so sorry I didn't get to them all. It absolutely uh, blew up and uh, just goes to show the, the level of interest and passion that's um, starting to build, I guess, as we head towards the referendum.
So um, members will have a, 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 an opportunity to watch the replay of this event uh, in the on-demand library. So if you want to become a member, growthfaculty.com is the place to go. Next Wednesday at the earlier time of 9am, we have one of the world's leading anti-racism educators, Netta Jenkins, who's going to lead a masterclass on how to build an inclusive organisation. So if you are interested in becoming a member of Growth Faculty, this is a great one for you to kick off with. Uh, and for those of you who are regulars, we'd love to see you there as well. Also, we've got two very popular events that are booking up fast. Our seven week Emerging Leaders Program, starting August 30 on the Foundations of Leadership. And in early September, our blockbuster in-person event with the world expert speaker on habits, James Clear, author of Atomic Habits. Details and bookings at www.growthfaculty.com. Again, thanks for being with us. Thanks for your time. Sorry I've gone over time, but I uh, hope to see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>